Hello and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Hello everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and welcome to episode 24, the Lunasad 2016. We're going to start off with a song, A Contest of Whiskies, by Emerald Rose, from an album called Emerald Unearthed, which I recently got at Calvera Fest. And then we are going right into Tarot Tips, which is my segment on how to choose a spread. After that, we will hear from Cabal with Voodoo, and he's going to teach us about making elotes and granita, followed by a song called Goddess Walking, which is by Mama Gina, and it's off of her new album, Solitaire. After that, we will hear from Shaylee and her segment of Nice Witch, and she will discuss getting inebriated at festivals. And then we will hear from Lord Riken in his segment of It'll Grow On You, where he teaches us about making Nervine tea. We'll follow this up and end our podcast with a song from Ginger Doss's album From Love to Love called Warrior. And I chose that one in honor of Lou for the Sabbath. I hope you all enjoy. John McKenna and John O'Leary argued in high court style Whose country had the best whiskey, the Scots or the Irish Isle? McKenna extolled the virtues of peat, O'Leary the sweet Irish springs, until at last they agreed to a contest to coronate the whiskey king. They set up a table in the corner with two bottles, two glasses, and thirst. They each poured a dram from their own land and expounded its virtues first. But with bottles exchanged, they poured once again, but with insults to brew and distill. O'Leary said Scotch whiskey tasted of dirt. Mechanical Irish weak swill. Now, hour by hour and bottle by bottle, bravely our warriors they fought, till a crowd gathered round to cheer and conjole and pay for each (laughs) bottle they brought. But stubborn men and more stubborn whiskey brought the sure moment to pass when neither of our valiant comrades could pick up their whiskey glass. (laughs) The crowd urged and cheered them on to drink until uncle was said. But John McKenna and John O'Leary both shrugged and fell over dead. As it lay on the floor, some said, what a shame. But both faces held a smile. They died in defense of distillery pride of the Scots and the Irish Isle. So raise up a toast to McKenna and O'Leary, and never mind the purse or the watch. We search for the best in the water of life. Irish whiskey, our single malt scotch. Slancha! Hey everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and I have another segment of tarot tips for you. And today's tarot tip segment is about choosing a spread. There are many types of spreads, and the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because when I first started reading tarot, I was only given one spread in the deck that I bought, and it was called the Celtic Cross. And I think that a lot of people, that's the first spread that they see and they think they have to use that spread for everything. And I'm here to tell you, it ain't so. In fact, I have to admit to a little bit of bias, I don't like the Celtic cross spread. I don't find having one card in each position to be all that telling. I don't find it to be very clear. It doesn't speak to me. And tarot speaks to me. I've been reading tarot for, oh God, I don't know, over 20 years at this point. Um, But I never use the Celtic cross spread. I just don't like it. 
Uh, I use several other spreads that I've been taught, some of which I've been given permission to teach other people and some of which I really can't, but the Celtic cross is not the one that I use the most. I find that the spread that I'm going to use really depends on the question, okay? For example, if I have an easy yes or no question or I need a really quick answer, then a lot of times I will use the three card spread. For example, yes or no questions, you can use a three card spread similar to a coin toss. Okay, so you lay out three cards and if two of them are upright, the answer is yes. And if two of them are reversed, the answer is no. And that's two or more. So obviously if all three cards are upright, the answer is yes. If all three cards are reversed, the answer is no. And that's very similar to just tossing a coin three times. There's not that much difference. Um, the other way that you can use a three card spread is to show really quickly past, present, future. Okay, so the card you lay down first would be the past, the card you lay down second would be the present, and the card you lay down third would be the future. Another way that you can use the three card spread is to be the question, the action, and the outcome. So the first card can be your question, the second card can be your action, and the third card that you lay down can be your outcome. Now I usually lay cards down left to right because that is how the English language is read, is left to right. And so um, if you come from a part of the world or you have a culture which reads right to left, then feel free to do it that way. It doesn't really matter. It's what matters is comfortable to you. And the other thing that matters is that you program your mind with what the cards are going to mean and what the spread is going to mean and how you are going to read it before you lay out the first card. So in other words, if you intend to read the spread, past, present, future, then as you're shuffling the cards, know in your mind that's how you're going to read the spread. Do not lay the cards down and then decide, oh, well, that kind of looks like the question, so I'm going to read it question, action, outcome. You want to know in advance how you're going to read those cards because it makes a difference. Larger questions need a larger spread. So there's quite a few that I've seen people use. I have seen people use something called the pyramid spread, which is kind of called a life spread. Um, I've seen it done a few different ways. So one way is that you, the top card is the person who's asking the question, which is also known as the querent or the person that you're reading for, because you don't always read for yourself. Sometimes you read for other people. And then the next row would be two cards below that, and that would be your question. And then three cards below that might be what's surrounding you. The four cards below that might be, you know, your actions. But I don't use this spread. So everybody that I've asked, each person has given me a different variation on it. I've also seen the spread done where they lay five cards across the top, and that's your foundation, and then four cards below that, and it means something, and three cards, and then two cards, and then one card is your outcome. So if you go online and you Google pyramid spread, you're going to find several different variations. Again, decide which one you're going to use, and how you're going to use it, and what the rows mean before you lay out the cards, even before you start shuffling the cards decide how you're going to lay this out. But that would be a spread that I would use for larger questions. Larger questions would consist of things like what's happening at work? Should I change jobs? You know, life issues that are happening around you that are a little more important and have a lot more nuances than things that can be answered in three cards or in a, in a quick question, you know, yes or no question. Another spread that you might want to try if you have some knowledge of astrology is an astrology spread. And what you would do is you would start with laying a card in the first house position, which is the first house just below the horizon on the left hand side. And then the next card would go in the second house and the next card would go in the third house and so on until you get all 12 houses. You have a card in each house. Now I say that this requires a little bit of knowledge of astrology because what you do is you blend the meaning of that house and the card meaning. So in the spread, where the card shows up 
is just as important as what the card means. And so, say, in the first house, the card is going to be about the self. And in the second house, the card could be about your finances. Um, and in the third house, the card could be about your communications, and so on. So the more you know about astrology, the better that reading is going to work for you. And that is a card spread that I've seen people use when they kind of need a general look at, hey, um, what's going on? You know, what what's going on right now in my life? Or they want to go in a general direction. Uh, should I go to nursing school? You know, something like that where they really need a little bit of direction on a whole life level. That's a good spread to use for that. I've also seen people that have um, used a spread that lays out like 52 cards, which is incredibly complex. And each um, position is a point in their life. I don't do that spread either. But again, you know, if you Google tarot spreads, you're going to come up with a ton of them. And one of the ways to decide, am I going to use this spread is to practice it, work with it, throw some cards on it, read for yourself, read for your spouse, read for other family members, read for basically my high priestess used to say, read for anyone that'll stand still and let you. And you pay it more attention to what you get right than what you get wrong, because basically nobody's right 100% of the time. If you were, you'd be buying lotto tickets all day long. You know what I'm saying? So if you have a good percentage of things coming out right, then you're, you know, you're doing fine. You're on the right track. You also have to know that the cards have meaning as they're laid next to each other. So if you have a spread that you're using and you only have one card in that position and you're not really sure how that card relates to that position, feel free to put another card there. You can put three cards. I happen to use a spread called the Seven Sisters Spread, which was taught to me by my high priestess. I teach this spread only in private workshops um, because that's my oath. It's not allowed to be published and it's not allowed to be put out on the internet. It can only be taught, you know, one-on-one -on -one or in a face-to-face -face workshop. Um, but this particular spread has three cards in each area. And I find that having more than one card to, to have the outcome or more than one card to show the question or more than one card to show this life area really helps because it gives you more of a combination. There's more possibilities there. It tells the story a little bit deeper than just one card would do. It gives you card combinations. It gives you car some cards in the upright positions, some cards in the reversed positions. Court cards can show up that can sometimes mean people. And I find that it really helps to open up the intuition and to give you a deeper level and a deeper meaning. So I would say if you are using a spread and you are having trouble with a particular spot in the spread that you're not really understanding the card, add more cards to that. And let's say you're using the Celtic cross and let's say that the outcome you always have problem with the outcome, that the outcome just, you know, that one card, it's like, well, if it's not the sun, it's not real obvious, right? If it doesn't show up as the devil, you don't really know, oh, is this going to work out or is it not going to work out? And it's, you know, there's all these shades of meaning and shades of gray, as it were. So use the Celtic cross and then always put three cards in that outcome position. You can, you can change it up. You can make that spread yours. Make that sucker work for you. You're not a slave to the spread, okay? So if you find that you like a particular spread, but you only have trouble in one area, like what lies beneath you, your foundation, or what's opposing you, or you know whatever the particular area is that you're having a little issue with, go ahead and see if putting down two or three cards on a routine basis makes that spread speak to you and work for you better. And if it does, then do it that way. Spreads can be completely personal. I also know people who will just lay down five cards in a row and that's it. And that's what they read. And it doesn't matter what the question is, that's what they read. Because that's what they've practiced doing and that's what they're comfortable with. And I say, that is absolutely fine. You have to do what's comfortable with for you. And the only way 
that you're going to figure that out is by practice. And so that is my last tarot tip on reading spreads. And that is practice, practice, practice. Use that spread. Use only that spread until you are completely comfortable with it, until you know what each one of those positions are, how they relate to each other, and what you're looking for in each one of those areas, what it relates to in life and what it means, how to read the card when the card's in that position. And if you practice that spread and you're still having issues with it, then toss it. Find something else that looks good. Find something else that looks like it's clear for you and then practice with that one and it may take you a while to find a spread that you really like that really clicks that when you get that spread you can read it that when those cards come out on that spread that you look at those cards and they start speaking to you and that's what you want to wait for that's what you want to look for but it isn't going to happen overnight in this world of instant gratification and I want it now and two-day shipping I have to tell you it doesn't happen overnight. It takes work. It takes reading for people. It takes using a spread over and over and over until it speaks to you. And if you want to try just using three cards at a time, then use three cards at a time. And you know what? You may end up creating your own spread. You may end up creating a spread where you lay down three cards and go, okay, this is you. And then the next three cards, okay, this is your question. And the next three cards, this is what's around you and then the next three cards this is what's against you and then the next three cards this is what you have to do to overcome it and then maybe the last three cards would be the outcome okay see look at that I just invented a spread it's that easy but like I said you have to use it and practice it until it becomes second nature until it's like a muscle memory that you own you don't learn how to ride a bike in one afternoon. It takes practice. And it's the same thing with reading a tarot spread. But I throw this out there for you because I don't want people to think that the Celtic cross is all there is. And I don't want people to think that you're stuck with one particular spread or you have to use the same spread for every single question because you do not. Make those cards work for you. Own them. Make them work. Get that whip out and whip those cards into shape. Because the more you do, the more you practice with the cards, the more you practice with the spreads, the more flexible you get, the more intuitive you will become. And the more your own third eye and your own intuition will open up and start speaking through you. A lot of times when I'm teaching tarot classes, I will come up with things that are not in the cards. And that is because I've been reading them for so many years that this is a key that unlocks my intuition. This is the key that I use. It doesn't work for everyone. Some people use runes. Some people use different things like astrology. Whatever you use, it doesn't matter. But it only comes if you practice at that particular skill. So go ahead and practice it. Like I said, read for anybody that will sit still. And you will find that your own intuition will start to take over and you will be reading the cards, but also things will come to you that are not part of that particular card. And maybe you don't know where it came from, but if it comes to you and it feels right, go ahead and say it. Because all they can do is say, hmm, nope, don't think so. And you've lost really nothing. You know, you don't have to be right all the time and they're not proving you wrong. It's just sometimes your game is on and sometimes your game is not. But that's the only other tip. Tarot is really good for when you're not completely on your game. Because knowing the meanings will help you to get back on track. And I think I covered that in a previous tarot tip, so I won't go into it again here. But having different spreads as part of your toolbox is an awesome thing. And I say, have as many as you want, practice as many as you can, and expand your horizons with tarot. Blessed be. This is Cabal, and welcome to Fudu. Yay, happy Lunasa. So it's the first harvest, finally. And in Florida, as you know, that happened in February. And Lunasa in Florida means one thing, and that is 
air conditioning. And with that, anything that you can do to stay cool, which includes things like drinking cold drinks, going by the ocean, or standing in the produce freezer at Costco. But I know that there are listeners north of Jacksonville, and Lamas also means corn. Yay, corn! And that would be maize in the UK or other parts of the former British Empire, except New Zealand, Canada, and Australia, because they got with the program. And by the way, the word maize enters English through the Spanish word maize, which itself comes from the word mahis, which is a word used for that grain by the Taino people, the First Nation of the Caribbean. Well, I happen to have a couple of opinions on corn. This will be very corn judgmental, so skip now if you have kind of pro-specific corn-specific recipes, centered corn something, whatever. I'll wait for you to hit the forward button and bye. Okay, corn is best fresh. Like, pick it, eat it. When we lived in Gettysburg, we had a cornfield with a stand a few hundred yards from the house, and yeah, everything else really does pale in comparison to the -the off-the-stock corn. You don't even really have to cook it, but for safety reasons, you clean it, boil it, and eat it. Now, the other opinion is that the best corn recipe is elotes from Mexico, which they got from their Aztec ancestors. Uh, This was an incredible gift. And by the way, the word elotes comes from the word elote, which is the Nahuatl word for corn, and Nahuatl is the Aztec language. So elotes are essentially grilled corn, and this is really all that you need to make them. So you need about six ears of corn for this recipe, and as fresh as possible is preferred then um, husk them and put them to the side. In a bowl, mix together one tablespoon of chili powder and one quarter teaspoon of cayenne powder. And you can increase both of these depending uh, on your taste. You're going to mix them with about a quarter cup of mayonnaise. Now, I personally like to add a little bit of Parmesan cheese to that mix, about a tablespoon, and mix it all together. And finally, add the juice of one lime wedge to that mayonnaise mixture and set the remaining wedges, cut them up and set them aside. The last thing that you need for this recipe is cotija cheese. And cotija cheese is uh, readily available in the other cheese section of the grocery store that is right next to the cheese section. I'm sure you've noticed that there's a cheese section next to a cheese section. And that other cheese section is Latin American cheeses. And it's going to crumble very much like feta. It's a cheese from the Michoacan area of of Mexico. And it breaks up, like I said, like feta, and it has a slightly salty taste. So so crumble up that cheese onto a plate. All right, back to the corn. First, start the grill and get it hot. This is a grilled corn dish. Um, You can also use the oven, but preheat it first to 425. Then rub the corn with olive oil, and once the grill or oven are ready, then switch the oven to broil. If you're using that, put the corn in. If you're using the grill, put the corn onto the grill. What you'll want to do is keep rotating the corn until you get that deep brown, almost burnt color on on all sides. You don't want to burn that corn, but you do want that dark, rich uh, brown color. By the way, if you put the corn on the grill, it's going to make this popping sound. And what's happening there is that you're getting a little bit of bursting of the kernel. And uh, and it's still going to be brown perfectly fine. All right, once that your corn is done and brown on all sides, remove it from the heat and let it sit a few minutes uh, to cool down. When the corn is used very hot, it's going to melt the mayonnaise. So wait until it cools down, maybe not to room temperature, but slightly warmer. Then slather on the mayonnaise mixture onto the corn and roll it in the crumbled cotija cheese and it's ready to eat. Yum. So I think also that elotes pair incredibly well with granita. This is a super simple Spanish Italian frozen dessert dish that's somewhere between a snow cone and a sorbet and it's a great way to end a meal. Uh, I personally like the strawberry version and the espresso version. I'm going to go over the berry version, but you can make it really with any kind of flavoring. Watermelon is also really, really good. Here's what you need to make it. You need a third of a cup of white sugar and one cup of water into a pan. If you want to substitute something other than sugar, you can't. You're out of luck because the chemistry of this dish 
requires that the sugar act as an antifreeze in the process. So if you don't want to use white sugar, skip the whole thing. Anyway, mix the water and sugar together and bring it to a boil until you have a simple syrup. You'll know that that's done when the mixture thickens slightly and there are no more granules of sugar left at the bottom of the pan. Like I said, the sugar is going to act as an antifreeze, so that's why substituting is impossible and you need it completely dissolved in the liquid in order for this to work. Now, pulse one pound of strawberries in a mixture, and again, you can use any kind of berry. You just need about a pound of them. You can also use other fruit, but depending on the fruit, the strength of the flavor is going gonna, is gonna to vary. So you might need to practice a little bit to get the strength of the flavor right. Anyway, take the pound of strawberries and put it in a mixer or food processor and process it until it's relatively smooth. You're going to add also to this about a tablespoon of lemon juice. The lemon juice is for chemistry purposes. Again, it's going to help preserve the color. And also add a little pinch of salt to that mixture. The salt is going to intensify the flavor a little bit. Finally, once that everything is pulsed together, mix the berry mixture and the simple syrup and place in a shallow pan that's going to go into the freezer. Now here's the hard part. Every 30 minutes or so, you're going to take the pan out of the freezer and scrape it with, uh, with a fork. So you're going to mix it up. I was going to say fluff it with a fork, but witches are listening. So do this about one and a half to two hours every 30 minutes. The mixture will become fluffier, there's that word again, and flaky, and it's going to turn into an icy treat. It's going to kind of mound up. Oh, there's another word. It's going to mound up into the plate. And basically it's becoming something that looks like uh, a cross between a sorbet and, and a snow cone. Once that, that's completely cold and frozen, scrape it and put it in a bowl and it's ready to serve. You can serve it with chopped mint leaves. Those leaves pair really well with berries. And also with the strawberry one, if you add a thin drizzle of balsamic vinegar, it really does enhance the flavor. If you wanted to make an espresso version, you use uh, espresso instead of the strawberries, and you also add chocolate liqueur. If you're interested in that recipe, just send me an email. So there it is. Yummy corn for Lunasa and a heat-cutting dessert for Florida. Enjoy. Have a great Sabbath.
And you're the goddess walking in this world Get up and stand your ground You're the queen of all that's in your grass And if I want to see you all on your knees Unless it's for your pleasure, child <laughs> Then it's anything you please There is no path before you But the one that Create. So what that stuff you're talking, girl Get out of your own way You can walk the straight and narrow Or you can tread this circle round Anyway you Get up and you can lose You're the goddess walking in this world 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 mm -hmm. You're the goddess walking in this world You're the goddess walking in this world Get up and stand your ground was Goddess Walking by Mama Gina from her album Solitaire. Next up, we're going to hear from Shaylee and her Nice Switch segment. My name is Shane. Welcome to Nice Witch, a Miss Manor segment for all Wiccans, witches, and pagans alike. Today's topic, becoming inebriated at a festival. Ever go to a festival and encounter someone so drunk they couldn't walk? So drunk that they got sick? I have. It's really not fun. Pagan festivals are a place where we should go to commingle with our own kind, to enjoy ourselves, to attend ritual, to attend workshops, to generally be with people who have similar beliefs to ourselves. They're not a place where we should go to get inebriated, to get so stupid drunk that we can't enjoy ourselves or that we cause others to not have fun. They're a place where we can go and connect to nature. We can go and enjoy camaraderie that comes with being with those like ourselves. Sure, we can party. Sure, we can drink. I have. I've done both. I've gone to a festival and had quite a few drinks. But to become so inebriated, to become so drunk, that you can disrupt the flow of ritual and not even know it? 
you become so intoxicated that you can sing inappropriate songs and say inappropriate things and or even get sick both at festival or in ritual that's that's taking it too far that's where you know you should stop you know everybody has a moment where they do something stupid everybody has a moment where they've taken it too far i understand that i do but you have to be considerate of those around you you go to a festival to do so many things that becoming so inebriated that you can't enjoy them it just doesn't make sense I know it costs me money to go to a festival. I'm sure it costs you. I don't know why you would go and spend the time, the energy, the money that it takes to go haul all your stuff over to a campsite or a festival site, pay all those dues and all those expenses to get there, and then not enjoy yourself. I guess that's something I can't understand. But when it comes to etiquette, it's also something you really shouldn't do. You need to always be considerate of other people, even when you're enjoying yourselves. And at a festival, becoming so intoxicated that you can cause those disruptions. It's just rude. I don't have a better word for it. It's just rude. As you can probably tell and hear, this particular topic is very personal to me. I went to a festival and... I had a bad experience with some persons who had become too intoxicated. So I apologize if I have come across too emotional or too severe. It's not my intention. I will say this one last thing. Festivals are meant to be enjoyed. And I'm not suggesting that we don't enjoy ourselves. Just remember to be kind. So remember... Whether we're all gathering to honor the gods, celebrate the seasons, mark the turning of the wheel, perform rituals, or simply to enjoy each other's company, or whatever the reason may be, we are gathering, and we all need to be considerate of each other. So enjoy yourselves, and remember to be a nice witch. Lady Bridget, and I'm here with Lord Riken and his segment, It'll Grow on You. And what have you got planned to tell us about today? Well, I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite herbal concoctions, uh, blends, whatever you want to call it. It's a Nervine tea that I first started using in the mid-70s, and I have never been without a jar of it available to me probably since 1975. So what is a Nervine tea? A Nervine tea is one that has a calming effect on the body and primarily for to help with anxiety and insomnia. And I got this recipe out of a little 18-page yellow pamphlet that I picked up in a health food co-op in New Orleans back in the summer of 75 and... It got me through my first wedding, and it got me through my children, <laughs> and it got me through many a stressful time. And as I say, even to this day, I have a container of it in there, but I will say, dear, that our life together is so good that I haven't used it in years. Oh, that's so sweet. But now let's get right to it. Um, the four ingredients in this are skullcap, peppermint, catnip, and valerian root. Uh, skullcap, Scutellaria laterifolia. Say that in English. <laughs> skullcap. <laughs> <laughs> skullcap is an herb which on its own is used for insomnia and anxiety. If you made a simple, that is a one herb, one flower tea, you could just use skullcap. It tastes like dried grass, basically. Ew. Yeah, it's just one of your, you know has many good properties to it, but it's a little lacking in the flavor department. 
you know, for 30, 40 years, I've just tell people to take this formula. Now everything has to come with uh, disclaimers. So skull cap, long-term use can cause liver damage. So what constitutes long-term use? Well, there's that. I suspect that long-term use of a leave would cause liver damage long before this would. Um, and long-term use of alcohol causes liver damage. liver damage. Yeah. At least the liver damage caused by skull cap is reversible. Uh, just quit taking it. It'll fix itself. Oh. But in other words, don't get dependent on it to go to sleep every night. This is a calmative anti-anxiety. This is to turn off the little gerbil running in your brain that won't let you get to sleep, mm. this this uh, formulation. The primary herb here, of course, is going to be valerian, the basis of Valium. But, uh, so we know it's good. Yeah, we, we know it's going to work. <laughs> but Skullcap in and of itself is a fairly good herb. Basically, the first three ingredients here are skull, Skullcap, Peppermint, and Catnip. And all of them are going to help buffer the valerian root in terms of it's upsetting the stomach or whatever. Before we go any further, let me start by saying that this is done with equal parts by weight, not equal parts by volume. You'll use equal parts by volume of the first three herbs, but the valerian root is much, much heavier. If you use an equal volume of valerian root, you'd have way too much in there, so... It's either equal parts by weight, or you just use a lot less valerian than you do the rest of those in there. So you could use like one ounce of each. If you use one ounce each of the other three, then all you would need to be about a tablespoon and a half of valerian root. But if you weighed it on a scale, you could use one ounce of each. That's what you're yes, saying? Yes, dear. Yeah. Okay. But an ounce, an ounce of peppermint, an ounce of skullcap, or an ounce of catnip is going to be a pretty big baggy. And you only need, you know, it'll be about a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons of valerian root. Chopped, coarse valerian root. Not valerian root tincture in alcohol. Not valerian root juice in a dropper bottle. Not valerian root that's been juiced and then freeze-dried to make a powder. All that's way too powerful for what we're talking about here. Um, Unless you just use a little common sense and use it accordingly. So at any rate, uh, skull cap to get back to that. Long-term use can cause liver damage. That is the only thing to be cautious of. And by that, I imagine they're talking far more than three weeks every night. But I've never used gold. I've, you know, I've never really suffered from insomnia other than occasionally. Or I may have a night where I know my brain's going to be just turned on too much. And I just need to quiet it down, turn the dial back some, and... This works pretty well and for sometimes that. people have a real stressed out day or they're going through a time in their life, like with mm-hmm. an illness, with a loved one or, you know, loss of a job or they have oh, to yeah. move or, you know, so well, you could use it every night for a couple of weeks and it would no be No problem okay. whatsoever. It would take a lot more use than that. I used a triple strength tea of, of uh, this Nervine tea to get through my first wedding, you know, because I was... Long, how long was that? <laughs> triple um, strength? Triple strength. <laughs> I instead of taking like you know a tablespoon of it in the water, I put three tablespoons in my boiling water, and <laughs> I I cranked it up there, big time. But I just was so mellow through my whole wedding; it wasn't even funny. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> how my wife felt about it, but you know that's a story I guess we'll never know. <laughs> Any rate, uh, the second one, peppermint, mentha perpita is the primary herb used for digestive issues, heartburn, nausea, cramps, things like this. And that's its purpose. Well, actually, its primary purpose here is to cut the terrible taste of the valerian root. Right. Which has a, well, it's not so much that it tastes bad as that it stinks. And uh, it's got a strong odor to it, so the peppermint helps to mask that. It helps to mask the uh, taste of it. It helps to mask... it says people actually use valerian root for stomach upset and it's like really when when do i want my stomach upset because if i just take straight valerian root my stomach gets all knotted and cramped well peppermint is also used it's one of the teas that they recommend for pregnant women Mm -hmm. to help with you know um, morning sickness morning sickness right in the first trimester so it does help buffer yeah it doesn't work it doesn't work for everybody all right. So at any rate, the peppermint's purpose in this mix 
is to buffer everything else, make it taste better, make it smell better, and make it easier on the stomach. The catnip, yeah, we're talking about, you know, uh, nephrita cataria, catar. Yeah. Uh, the thing, same thing that drives your cats crazy, it's good for you too. It is also an herb which used by itself. If the only thing you got on hand is some of your cat's catnip, and you're having a stressful night, well, just steal a bit and make yourself a cup of tea with it. It is extremely safe, except don't use it during pregnancy because it will stimulate a period. Also, catnip is so effective that you shouldn't use it for at least two weeks before surgery. Oh, wow. Because uh, it has a sufficiently depressant effect that it could increase, if there's catnip basically in your bloodstream, it could increase the uh, strength of the uh, medications that they would be giving you to put you under. Hmm. So don't want to do that. So if you're already taking medication for anxiety, you should not use the catnip in well, conjunction with that. You know, th- that's a caveat with this all the way across the board, is that if you're on an anxiety medication or a depressant of some sort... Or antidepressant of some sort. Well, here's yeah. the thing is the valerian is actually been found to have some antidepressant properties too well that's what i'm saying if you're already on medication you better check with your doctor before you use yeah do a lot of of do a lot of research on there but in a normal healthy person that doesn't suffer from a chronic issue of this nature uh it's pretty darn good stuff anywho the catnip talk about crazy people apparently are smoking catnip Really? And it's quite poisonous that I way. I miss that tra- yeah, I, train. Yeah, <laughs> I miss that train, too. It's like, I, wait a minute. I was there in the 60s and 70s. What the hell? I've smoked some things, but I don't think I've ever smoked catnip. Yeah. Well, people also will throw massive amounts of catnip into boiling water, boil it down to a really strong tea, and take that. And that could be strong enough to give knock- you some liver damage, too. Ooh, and knock you out? I don't know if it'll knock you out or not, but that's the point. They're taking it so they can get the effect of being... Not in command. That's the other nice thing about this stuff. I particularly am an extremely light sleeper. And when I had children, the slightest little (laughs) in the night, and I was wide awake. And uh, I was a walking zombie there until I started taking the tea. But I've never taken so much, I've never taken so much of this tea that I have not been able to come fully alert and fully awake when I needed to. It really doesn't have a depressant effect. It kind of eases you into sleep. It kind of just relaxes you a little bit. I guess the only other thing similar to, I guess, I the only way I've ever used marijuana was as a uh, tea. And I didn't like the taste. I didn't like the effect on my stomach. But it had kind of pretty much the same mellowing property. So I never bothered to try that again because I already had this. <laughs> but now let's get into the main problem, which is valerian root really a very safe herb. You might think to yourself there'd be all kinds of counterindications, but really, it's been heavily researched. Obviously, the Valium came from it. And it is determined to be likely safe as long as it's used reasonably and in moderate dosages. It apparently is a sedative on the brain. Interesting, just like so many other things, just like garlic, Mm -hmm. they really don't know which of the properties of valerian root is the one that really has the effect on the body. They got Valium out of it, but somehow or other, they don't know what the property of valerian root is that causes this kind of calming effect on the mind Hmm. and the central nervous system. Of course, valerian is valeriana officinalis. That shows you how long it's been around. Anything that has the name officinalis on it was uh, in wide use back in Linnaeus' time. Uh, But it's good for any and all sleep disorders, anxieties. It's a sedative on the brain and nervous system. It just improves sleep quality. Do not take with any drugs that slow the central nervous system. Now, is this the end-all and be-all? No. There are other wonderful herbal teas that can have the same effect. I thoroughly enjoy passion flower. Mm. Um, Hops. Why do you think beer mellows you out so much well guess what hop flowers are also a really good calmative calmative and uh, sleep inducer lemon balm is heavily used in fact there are many recipes if you wanted to substitute lemon balm or add lemon balm to this recipe just to improve the flavoring it's also a calming herb 
And kava, I use kava for a short time. I find that my good old standard Nervine tea works as well or better. So to sum it up, skullcap, catnip, both mild, mint-based, and so soothing on the stomach. Peppermint, really soothing on the stomach, really improves the flavor. Valerian, the primary ingredient. Mm -hmm. If you don't happen to have valerian but you have the other tea, Make yourself a tea anyway. It'll still work, not just as well as it would with valerian. If you're really, I mean, here's the way I make it. As I said, equal parts by weight, or if you want an ounce of each of the other three, and then just a tablespoon and a half or so of chopped valerian root dried. Bring your water to a boil. I can't be bothered most of the time. I have a prepared mix of it. I just put a couple of tablespoons of that in there in a teacup and... Off we go. So it's a couple of tablespoons, or do you mean teaspoons? I meant tablespoon. Tablespoons in eight ounces of water? Sixteen. In sixteen ounces of water. Okay, so it would be roughly one tablespoon per eight ounces of water. Yeah. Okay. Uh, But uh, if you have the ingredients separate and you want to, bring your water to a boil, put in the valerian root first, let the valerian root simmer for a couple of minutes... Turn the water off, add everything else in, stir, 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 leave it sit. You'll have a knockout dose that'll do you in. Uh, You may need to, once you've tasted it, you may want to increase the amount of peppermint because it's going to be stronger than it would be if you just put it in the way I made up the formulation. Can you add a little honey? Absolutely. And honey won't... um... That's no effect other than sweeten everything up. Okay. Uh, these days, I'd put in stevia. Yeah, I was going to say you know, stevia. I used to use honey, stevia. of course, but these days I'd use stevia probably so I wouldn't have to have the thick effect of the honey and the sugar because what is the sugar going to do? Oh, sugar is a stimulant. Right. That's why I was thinking maybe not to put honey in it. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah, stevia would be better. I usually didn't. I either, either just put a little bit of honey or no honey at all. Depends on what my and purpose was. how long was. does it need to steep? Five minutes. Okay, that's not bad. No. And it's ready to go. Uh, It's one of my go-tos. It's one of the things that I always want to have on hand just in case I need it. And there have been times when I've gotten up at 2 o'clock in the morning and made myself a cup and gone back to bed and gotten a good night's sleep. And as opposed to taking an naproxen PM, you know, which if I don't take an naproxen PM by 8.30 at night, then I have a hard time getting up at 6.30 the next morning. Uh, wow. And that's only one. I don't take two. I only take one. Yeah, I've been known to take a sleeping pill at times. Like if I'm in a hotel room or something, I really don't sleep well if I'm not in my own bed. But if I don't take that pill by 11 p.m., I have a hard time waking up at 8. I mean, it. I'll sleep 9, 10 hours if I take one of those. So this sounds like I would be much better off just doing that instead. Yeah, but I want to see the look on your face first time I give you a cup of it. <laughs> Does it really taste that bad? No. He says with a smirk. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say. You're, you you're asking the man that you will not, I get, here, taste this, and you'll go, why? How bad is it? It is. Well, you do. <laughs> you, you sneak some stuff in on me that, yeah. you know, it's really awful, and you've got this little glint in your eye, and people listening cannot see the, the smirk <laughs> on your face. Yeah. So really, honestly, is, does this Nervine tea taste that bad that you're going to want to add something to it? It certainly doesn't taste as bad as just taking a valerian root tea. And it certainly doesn't taste as bad as a lot of other things. But it's but nothing that they're going to love. It's nothing you're going to love. Okay. It's just hold your nose and get it down. I see. Because it's good <laughs> in the long run. So it'll work for you, but it's not something that you're going to... Say, ooh, this is delicious. I'm going to drink this every night. Uh, yeah, not <laughs> not likely. Well, at least you're honest. Once I hold you to the wall. <laughs> yeah, but it spoils all my fun when all these people come up and go, I tried that stuff. It was terrible. And I go. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the point. The point is to, you know, be informative. Mm. Well, this works really well. I may have given it to my children on one or two occasions you know, when they were sick and having trouble sleeping, but I've mostly always recommended it for adults. Basically for adults, yeah. yeah. That, I mean, that's a good point to make. 
you know. And kids are you know, kids are going to regulate because even if they need it, they're not going to drink this if they don't have to. <laughs> the taste. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lord Riken. Quite welcome. Pleasant dreams. Hi, everyone. Before we begin our last segment of this episode, we'd like to thank you for listening. Putting a podcast together is a time-consuming labor of love, but knowing that someone is listening to our hard work and hopefully gaining something from it makes it worthwhile. Would you let us know you like the podcast? By going to our website at emlc.net, click on the podcast tab, and write a comment. Tell us what you like and what you'd like to hear more of on our podcast. And even better, why not leave us a rating on iTunes? Ratings help us become more visible to more people. It's not about ego. It's all about service. Thank you, and blessed be. Our last song is Warrior by Ginger Doss from her album, From Love to Love. And thank you all for listening. Have a wonderful Lunasad. Or Lamas. There's a piece of me you never see Standing on the shore Shouting at the sea How fast Never water Nothing could stop me But such a vast ocean from Kissing you Right now Oh Make it Work somehow. Oh. There's a piece of me that's afraid. A very large piece of an impractical bun. I don't like the taste of it. It's always so good at an inopportune time I'm gonna took that first step back On oh, you did not get to see it Forget that this life isn't worth every single tear. Oh.